Hi everyone, welcome back to English 112 for our very last class. Today is Thursday, December 15th, where we are putting some closure onto poetry. And as you know, your poetry journal, journal number three, is due today on the 15th at 11.59 p.m. And you can send that to my email, ruiz, R-U-I-Z, at gcc dot M-A-S-S dot E-D-U. And my intent is to try to get those returned to you before your final examination, which will be posted on Thursday, the 22nd at 1 p.m. This is the time that would have been chosen by the college if we were meeting in person. And you will have 24 hours to take that examination. If we were taking it in person, you would have approximately two hours. So that's about as much time as I anticipate that you would be taking for this particular exam. Certainly not 24 hours, but you've got the day in which to take the exam. The bulk of it will be on poetry, well, where I will have a selection of poems from our poetry section and ask you to choose two and to explicate or analyze those poems. It is open book, open notes, so you can utilize things like your journals. You can utilize things like our a class um, information. I've fallen a little bit behind with our class discussion forum questions, but I'll be catching up with them over the weekend. And basically, as I indicated, paper number two, which happens to be on drama, um, is due at any point up until today, the 15th, which is, again, Thursday, if you're watching this, on the 15th, because I have my own deadlines in terms of when I'm going to be handing in um, information for the registrar about final grades. So in terms of thinking about where we are with poetry, I had left you off with Listening to America by Allen Ginsberg. So I wanted to talk about that. You'll notice that in the notes below, I've also indicated two music videos that you might want to watch. You're not necessarily required to. You might be familiar with the very famous song Sounds of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel. And not only is that song, I think, an incredible example of poetry, it's just so well written. And we've been talking about how poetry shares so many elements with music. But I also wanted to indicate how the reading of or the singing of those words can completely alter its meaning. So we've been listening to different readings of poems. Think about something like The Road Not Taken and the reading by at the actual author and how that would be different from a professional reader, for instance. And that said, when you listen to the same lyrics by these two musical artists, Sounds of Silence um, lyrics by Simon and Garfunkel and also by Disturbed, you'll see that the song has a very different tone, even though the words are the same. So I thought you might be interested in that. But Going back to America by Allen Ginsberg, and I had given you a live reading to listen to by Ginsberg himself, we could tell that the audience obviously was quite engaged. And in fact, the way he read it, it, it was actually more humorous than serious. Though if you were just to read it on your own, it definitely sounds more serious than humorous, though there is a good amount of sarcasm involved in it. And I talked a little bit about beat poetry, this very... Um, unconventional kind of poetry that came out in the 1950s in California, mostly in Berkeley, that was very defiant and stream of consciousness to try to duplicate our thought processes, deliberately unclear with lots of topical references, usually about events that from Ginsburg's perspective um, illustrated the injustice of our society. And Many times individuals indicate that this poem, even though it was written in 1956, could be applicable to today's world, that it sounds incredibly contemporary. And I, I just wanted to go through a few of the elements of that particular poem. And when he says at the very beginning, I've given you all and now I'm nothing, the idea is, is that he has sacrificed himself for America and America hasn't lived up to its end of the bargain. 
But when he says something like $2.27, January 17, 1956, we assume the date is when he wrote the poem. We don't necessarily know what $2.27 references. Perhaps that is how much America thinks he's worth. Perhaps that's how much money he has in his pocket. Perhaps that's how much money he has in his bank account. Um, perhaps that's how much money he thinks America itself is worth. So there are lots of possibilities here. When he says, I can't stay in my own mind, there's oftentimes references to madness and insanity. And actually, Ginsburg was known for being in and out of mental institutions. And he oftentimes critiques government authority. And when he talks about the atom bomb and the human war, and when he says quite explicitly, go fuck yourself with your atom bomb, a bomb being very much a phallic symbol, but also trying to shock, perhaps even titillate the audience. And usually you get two camps with Ginsburg, either people who see him as prophetic um, because he was so um, real and, and, and so blunt or, or others who see him as just basically muttering nonsense and, and, and very um, self-centered and, and, and self-indulgent. Um, but when he says, I don't feel good, don't bother me. I won't write my poem till I'm in my right mind. Of course, he's written his poem. So does that suggest that he is in his right mind? And if that's the case, maybe it's America that's not in its right mind. When he asks questions like, when will America be angelic? You know, in other words, when will it be holy? When will it, you, it take off its clothes? In other words, when will it show the truth? Um, when will you look at yourself through the graves? When will America live up to all of the suffering and all of the death that it has imposed upon its citizens? When will you be worthy of your million Trotskites or why are your library is full of tears? The idea of the true history of America, which can be found in the libraries rather than the superficial history that's filled with hollow patriotism. When will you send your eggs to India? The idea of when will we no longer be so American centric and think about the world and sharing our resources with the world. I'm sick of your insane demands. And it keeps going back and forth of who's insane, whether it be America, whether it be him, because after all, he is part of America, perhaps both. When can I go into the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks? And the idea is that so much of America is based on superficiality and that you oftentimes have access and power based on and privilege based on things like beauty. Your machinery is too much for me. Um, there's oftentimes criticism in his poetry about the mechanization of society, about the dehumanization that's occurring through uh, factory work. You could say something comparable is being discussed now with things like technology and artificial intelligence. And then he makes references to, are you being sinister or is this some form of practical joke? Again, sort of challenging us. Tell me if this is not true. And when he says, I'm, I'm trying to come to the point, of course, that's the exact opposite of what we see in this poem. It's one of the longest poems, perhaps the longest poem that we've read over the course of this semester. I refuse to give up my obsession. Stop pushing. I know what I'm doing. And I haven't read the newspaper for months. Every day somebody goes on trial for murder. You know, and, and someone might say that that also is their in, um, reflections about the media as well, that it's all negativity. Um I used to be communist when I was a kid. I'm not sorry. And he oftentimes talks about his political affiliation with communism. I smoke marijuana every chance I get. Again, he was well known for his drug use, even in a time when marijuana was illegal. I sit in my house on ends and stare at the roses in my closet. And is that because he's in some sort of a drug induced uh, situation that he sees roses in his closet? Is it uh, literally that he's staring at rose wallpaper in his closet? Is he making reference to his sexual orientation because he was openly gay at a time when it wasn't uh, common for individuals to admit their um, sexual orientation? So is he talking about being in the closet? or getting out of the closet or his attempt. I go to Chinatown, I, I get drunk and I never get laid. Again, you can see he's talking about some very um, risque topics in a way that we wouldn't have seen with much of the poetry that we've read thus far. My mind is made up, there's going to be trouble. You should have seen me reading Marx, and of course Marx is for, part of the Communist Manifesto. 
The irony that my psychoanalyst thinks I'm perfectly right, which gets to the question of who is sane and insane. I won't say the Lord's Prayer. It oftentimes is questioning the idea of religion. I'm mystical visions, cosmic vibrations. That's probably quite literal in terms of his drug use. It anticipates much of the drug use and abuse of the 60s. I haven't told you what you did to Uncle Max after he came over from Russia. Again, the idea of what have our wars done to our citizens. Perhaps one of the most important lines, I'm addressing you. And this means us, the reader. If we don't agree with Ginsburg, this is our opportunity to show him wrong. And he says, am I going or are you going to let your emotional life be run by Time magazine? That he's obsessed with it. If we were to update it, perhaps we could say, are you going to let your emotional life be run by TikTok, for instance? Um, he literally did read in the Berkeley Public Library, and that's where he did some of his writing as well. You tell me about responsibility. Businessmen are serious and movie producers are serious. Everyone's serious but me. Or is it that he's the serious one because he's questioning what's wrong in America and the movie producers are not serious because they're engaged in fiction? It occurs to me that I am America is one of the most important lines because this is where Ginsburg admits that he himself has some culpability. And I'm talking to myself again. In other words, is anybody listening to what I'm saying? And talking about some of the anxieties about Asia taking over the superpower status of the United States, something that is still a uh, tension in our current time. Sometimes the poetry falls apart. It, do it doesn't even look like a poem. It looks more like prose. My national resources consist of two joints of marijuana, millions of genitals, and unpublished private literature that jet planes 1,400 miles an hour, 25,000 mental institutions. Um, and then it, it happens again when he talks about Mama. When I was seven, they took me to a communist cell meeting. They sold us carbonzos, a handful per ticket. A ticket cost a nickel. The speeches were free. Everybody was angelic and sentimental about the workers. It was also sincere. You have no idea what a good thing the party was in 1835. Scott Neary was a grand old man, a real mensch. Mother Bloor, the silk strikers. I mean, this is one long on, run on senses. It doesn't even begin to look like poetry. The idea behind the beats is that they oftentimes are nonsensical because their subject matter is nonsensical. They're oftentimes crude and ugly because the subject matter is crude and ugly. They're oftentimes offensive because their subject matter is offensive. And when he asks, how can I write a holy litany in your silly mood? And we keep going back and forth. Is it America that's insane or in a silly mood? Or is it the author Ginsburg or a combination of the two? And he says, I'll continue like Henry Ford. My strokes are as individual as his automobiles. And if you know anything about Henry Ford and he's responsible for the assembly line, again, the factory and the mechanization of society that occurred afterwards, where every product is the same. A strophe is a movement in uh, Greek drama where all of the course members are all engaged in the same movement. Um, and then he's talking about freeing Tom Mooney and saving the Spanish loyalists and Sacco and Vanzetti must not die. And these are very topical references from individuals that he believes have experienced injustice, including the Scottsboro Boys. Um, and then he talks a little bit about the blame that oftentimes is tossed around in America. America's them bad Russians, them Russians, them Russians, and them Chinamen, and them Russians. The Russia wants to eat us alive. The Russia's power mad. She wants to take our cars from out of our garages. The automobile was so important during this time period. It really led to the white flight that we had talked about with Raisin in the Sun, where families would leave the city and go into the suburbs. And this was supposed to be a sign of economic and social success of having a garage and a car. Um, it's become almost a necessity now, but at the time it was seen much more of a luxury. Her wants to grab Chicago. Her needs a red Reader's Digest. Her wants our auto plants in Siberia. Him big bureaucracy running our filling stations. That no good. Ugh. Him make Indians learn read. Him need big black ends. Ha. Huh. And again, we can see how offensive the language is. He's mimicking second language errors. And then he says, this is quite serious. Is This is the impression I get from looking at the TV set. And again, he's quite critical of the media. Again, if you were writing this poem now, I suppose he'd be quite critical of the internet. I better get right down to the job. It's true. I don't want to join 
the army or turn lathes and precision parts factories. I'm nearsighted and a psychopathic anyway. And I'm putting my queer shoulder to the wheel. And, and by queer, he was also making reference to sexual orientation. Though, of course, the use of the word queer hadn't been taken back by, um, by um, it's, it's, it's uh, from a slur into a, a term of empowerment the way it has now. So this gives you a little bit of an idea about how um, groundbreaking and, and different the poetry can be. Certainly it's nothing like, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? That said, I wanted to end with The Lover Not Taken. And I'm hopeful that this is a poem that sounded familiar to you because we've also discussed The Road Not Taken. And The Lover Not Taken is a parody. The idea behind a parody is that it mimics the original enough so that you know what's being mocked, but there's exaggeration there so that it's humorous. So if you're familiar with things like Saturday Night Live or The Simpsons, those are great examples of parody. And I wanted to assign it because not only is it a parody, but I think it also is very representational of its time period. 1984, we had established with Robert Frost that his poem was about choices and the regret and longing that occurs with the choice that isn't made. And that it's impossible to have two things at once, to make cho two choices at once. That's not the message we get in The Lover Not Take It. Perhaps it is possible to have two things at once. The 1980s were oftentimes known as a decade of greed, and perhaps that's illustrated in this poem. And this is where Blanche Farley, it was a female rather than Robert Frost, who was a male. That perhaps is also important in terms of our understanding this particular poem, which is on page 797 of the text that I had ordered, the edition for class. The lover not taken, committed to one, she wanted both. And mulling it over, long she stood alone on the road, loath to leave, wanting to hide in the undergrowth. This new guy, smooth as a yellow wood, really turned her on. She liked his hair, his smile. But the other, Jack, had a claim on her already, and she had to admit he did wear well. In fact, to be perfectly fair, he understood her. His long, lithe frame beside hers in the evening tenderly lay. Still, if this blonde guy dropped by some day, couldn't Way just lead on to Way? No. Nah. For if Way led on and Jack found out, she doubted if he would ever come back. Oh, she turned with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. She would be telling this, and I, she would say, stood faithfully that by. And by then, who would know the difference? With that in mind, she took the fast way home, the road by the pond, and phoned the blonde. I think this poem is so interesting because, again, it uses phrases and elements of Frost's poem, but it uses them in different ways. So now the choice is specific rather than a symbolic choice of a road. It's about wanting two men. And we know what she's supposed to do is to be faithful to the one that she has a committed relationship with. In fact, he, she even gives him a name, Jack, as opposed to the other one who's nameless, which goes to show that they have a much more distant relationship. But she has a physical yearning and desire for him. This new guy who's smooth as a yellow wood, and wood can oftentimes be used for slang for erection. And, of course, there's sexual undertones in this poem. He really turned her on, and she liked his hair, his smile. And in, in theory, that's the yellow wood. But of course, we can think of that in, in multiple ways. Of course, yellow wood was what Frost had used in terms of the choice in the woods um, where I had suggested perhaps it was a reference to autumn. And that if the blonde guy dropped by someday, couldn't way lead on to way? In other words, wouldn't it be quite possible to give in to, to physical desire? But no, she says, if Way led on and Jack found out, she doubted he would ever come back. So she's concerned that one choice would preclude the other. Oh, she turned with a sigh, somewhere ages, ages hence, and said, I stood faithfully by, by, by that, but by then, who would know the difference? In other words, is this choice really that significant in the overall scheme of the universe? Certainly significant for her and the people involved, but maybe in terms of life itself, it's not that significant. And we still don't know what she did. She took the fast way home, so one assumes she took the easy way. 
the road by the pond and phone the blonde. But what is the easy way? Is the easy way having the affair? Or is the easy way staying committed? And note the title. It's the lover not taken as opposed to the lover taken. Again, that sense of loss or regret. So I wanted to give you an example of a parody. I also wanted to give you an example of a contemporary author who's local, and that's Martina Spada, who teaches at UMass Amherst in the English department. Actually, he started as an attorney and was writing poetry in his spare time, and now he's completely shifted gears. Now he's a professor in his full time and practices law in his uh, spare time. Um, and he is from Puerto Rico, and this is important in terms of understanding Coca-Cola and Coco Frio, which is his poem about Puerto Rico. And I'm Puerto Rican myself, so I, I always feel a special affinity to this particular poem. And he talks a little bit about how he grew up in Brooklyn. I actually grew up in the Bronx, but Brooklyn and Bronx are very close to one another in New York City, which happens to be an island, by the way. People tend to forget that because it's so urban. But Puerto Rico is also an island. And the history of Puerto Rico is quite interesting because in some ways it is part of the United States and in other ways it is not part of the United States. It's a territory. So it has some of the rights, but not all of the rights of statehood. Um, the poem, Martina Spada, uh, he, he clearly indicates that it's autobiographical, but it's also symbolic as well, where he talks about issues such as assimilation. So I wanted to read this poem to you. On his first visit to Puerto Rico, the island of family folklore, the fat boy wandered from table to table with his mouth open. At every table, some great aunt would steer him with cool, spotted hands to a glass of Coca-Cola. One even sang to him, and all the English she could remember, a Coca-Cola jingle from the 40s. He drank obediently, though he was bored with this potion, familiar from soda fountains in Brooklyn. Then, at the roadside stand off the beach, the fat boy opened his mouth to Coco Frio, a coconut chilled, then scalped by a machete, so that a straw could inhale the clear milk. The boy tilted the green shell overhead and drooled coconut milk down his chin. Suddenly, Puerto Rico was not Coca-Cola or Brooklyn, and neither was he. For years afterward, the boy marveled at an island where people drank Coca-Cola and sang jingles from World War II in a language they did not speak, while so many coconut in the trees sagged heavy with milk, swollen and unsuckled. And he does say, again, it is somewhat autobiographical, that this was his first visit to Puerto Rico, where he's visiting it more like a tourist because he is now living in New York City. Puerto Rico means rich port, um, so it, it's an island that's filled with abundance. And he indicates that he was indeed literally the, a fat boy, but the fat boy also represents American Americans who are... Um, known for their consumption and overconsumption. And he's wandering from table to table with his mouth open. In other words, he's hungry for something. And at every table, some great aunt would steer him with cool, spotted hands. So basically the older generation. Two glass of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola being perhaps one of the most prominent symbols of the United States globally. One even saying to him in all the English she could remember a Coca-Cola jingle. And in other words, the island has been so indoctrinated with and so assimilated, so Americanized that basically it's it's singing the advertising jingles from American products. He drank obediently, though he was bored with this potion familiar from soda fountains in Brooklyn. This isn't what he's looking for. He wants his cultural identity. He doesn't want something that reflects the United States. Then on a roadside stand off the beach. The fat boy opened his mouth to Coco Frio. And again, think about the difference between Coca-Cola, which is sugar water that's produced in a factory, mass produced in a factory, and that's known for being terribly unhealthy, as opposed to a roadside stand at the beach. This is as local, as, as organic as you're going to get. And 
this is where he tries Coco Frio, a drink that is an exact contrast to Coca-Cola. This is a coconut chilled and then scalped by a machete so that a straw can inhale the clear milk. Again, so it's it's something that's nutritious, it's something that's organic, it's something that's natural, as opposed to the unnatural sugar water of Coca-Cola that's made mostly for profit. Um, and the idea of milk is supposed to bring forth images of childhood and suckling, and he uses that language a little bit later on, is that he's looking for nourishment. He's looking for his motherland, in fact. Suddenly, Puerto Rico wasn't Coca-Cola or Brooklyn, and neither was he, that this drink was able to connect him with his cultural heritage. For years afterwards, the boy marveled at an island where the people drank Coca-Cola and sang jingles from World War II in a language they did not speak. And again, Puerto Rico is an interesting place in that it has retained much of its cultural identity. Its primary language is Spanish, for instance, but its secondary language is English. Um, and again, it's in that in-between world of both being part of the United States, but not part of the United States. Much of it has to do with tax incentives as to why it is in its particular position. And there are two opposing forces, one saying that it should become an independent nation and the other saying that it should be granted statehood. So it's quite a thorny political debate. So many coconuts in the trees sagged heavy with milk. And the coconuts and the trees are supposed to represent the natural and the cultural identity that people are ignoring so that they can embrace the assimilationist culture of America. I, I can't help but think of Benita and some of her criticisms and uh, Raisin in the Sun. And that these coconuts were swollen and unsuckled. And these coconuts are almost like breasts. And again, this idea that he is looking for nourishment, for suckling, for um, his motherland, um, for the idea of his identity. So this poem, I think, is is going to be, I, I can't predict, but we talked about the canon, those works that are considered by scholars and critics worthy of literary study. And usually one of the things that makes something part of the canon is that it stood the test of time, and that it's gone through generation after generation. This poem was written in 1993, so it's not old enough to have stood the test of time. But I believe, my suspicion is, is that in another hundred years, Martina Spada and his poetry will be right up there with the Frosts of the world and the Dickinsons of the world. So again, I, I don't know. And my suspicion as well is that a young poet by the name of Amanda Gorman will also be in that category. If you had the pleasure of seeing and watching her during the last presidential inauguration in 2021, you saw how unifying her poetry and her presentation was The Hill We Climb. Keep in mind, this was shortly after the January 6th insurrection, where basically um, Capitol Hill was overrun, and we came very close to losing our democracy. Um, and I can still remember viscerally the fear of, of, of what could have happened on that day. And, and sometimes it's better not to analyze poetry. Maybe it's better just to experience poetry. I have a video of her performing her poem, and, and she is as much a performer as she is a poet and a writer. And you'll see that um, in the video that I'm going to ask you to watch. I'm not going to interpret this poem for you. I'm just going to leave this as our ending poem and ask you just to savor it and appreciate it the way that we all experienced it um, when we first heard it during the inauguration. Of course, afterwards, then it appeared in print and then we could go through and explicate and analyze in the way that we've done before. But I just wanted to leave you with this unifying poem of, of hope, the hill we climb. And say that, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. So with that said, we have one last class that happens to be the final examination, which again is scheduled for... Thursday the 22nd at 1 p.m. So I'll be posting the final and some um, goodbyes as well. 
So I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And I'll see you during the final exam, so to speak. Take care. Bye.